We would like to extend a very warm welcome to our audience attending this webinar on COVID-19 era, virtual courts and its future implementation. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. The pandemic is unprecedented. We are in the middle of a lockdown and so is the entire world. We are indeed very fortunate to be attending this webinar from the safety and comfort of our homes. And we must be grateful for that. Our thoughts and prayers go out to the families across the world who are battling COVID-19 at this moment. Before we start, we must also take a moment to thank those who are helping humankind find this, fight this pandemic and risking their lives while doing that. However, as they say, the, the show must go on. In fact, this is particularly apt for the topic of our webinar today, which is COVID-19 era virtual courts and its future implementation. For most of us who are dispute resolution practitioners in India, litigation still constitutes the fundamental mode of dispute resolution in India with physical access to courts having been taken for granted. Therefore, it has come as a shock to the system that as a result of the pandemic, courts across the countries have had to go into lockdown mode and quickly transition to virtual filings and hearings. I must, however, state that the Supreme Court and our High Court, especially Delhi High Court, have been for some time now already advocating electronic filings. However, the pace at which it was happening always had some scope for expedition. One can hope that the silver lining in the present dire situation may be that this disruption will pu push us towards adoption of newer technologies and expedite the pace at which virtual processes are adopted, thus bringing in efficiencies in justice delivery system. However, before we delve any further into our topic for the day, let me take the liberty of introducing my esteemed fellow panelists for this webinar being Honorable Mr. Justice Rajiv Sahai Endlock, Sitting Judge, Delhi High Court, Senior Counsel Par Excellence, Mr. K.V. Vishwanathan, my esteemed colleague, Ms. Venita Bhagava, Partner Dispute Resolution at Khatan and & Company, and myself, Sanjeev Kapoor, Partner Dispute Resolution at Khatan & Company. Let me start by introducing the man who needs no introduction, Honorable Mr. Justice Rajiv Sahai Endlaw. Justice Endlaw did his LLB from Campus Law Center, Delhi, and enrolled as an advocate with War Council of Delhi on July 1982. He is known to be a doyen of original side litigation and had a rich and diverse practice before the Delhi High Court and the subordinate courts in the field of real estate, family, civil, and arbitration law. He was appointed as an additional judge of Delhi High Court on 11th April 2008 and became a permanent judge on 6 July 2011, where he continues to hold office till date and has passed several landmark judgments. Thank you, Honorable Judge, and we are grateful for you to join us today. Our second panelist today is Senior Counsel Pa Excellence, Mr. K.V. Vishwanathan, who we have had the pleasure of briefing on numerous occasions. Mr. Vishwanathan was designated as a Senior Advocate in 2009 and has over 32 years of experience. He was an additional Solicitor General of India between 2013 and 14. He has appeared in numerous commercial and constitutional matters before the Honorable Supreme Court, as well as high courts across the country on a regular basis, including in a large number of reported landmark cases. Mr. Vishwanathan has also had the privilege of assisting the Honorable Supreme Court in diverse branches of law in the capacity of a Micah's QRI. We are honored to have him with us today. Our third panelist today is Ms. Vinita Bhagava. Ms. Bhagava is a partner of the dispute resolution team of Khatan and Company. She is also an advocate on record of the Honorable Supreme Court of India. Vanita has almost 20 years of experience in a variety of matters, including matters relating to constitution law, taxation law, environment law, corporate shareholding disputes, and arbitration. Her fora of practice includes the Supreme Court, High Court, National Green Tribunal, National Company Law Tribunal, to name a few. Thank you, Vanita. Lastly, I, Sanjeev Kapoor, am a partner in the dispute resolution team of Khatan & Company. My areas of practice include constitutional law, environment law, mining, energy, and infrastructure, and journal trade and commercial laws and arbitration laws. I take this opportunity to thank my fellow distinguished panelists for taking time out for this webinar. This webinar has been set up as an interactive session. You can submit questions online at any time during the webinar. There is a chat window on your screen. At any stage during the session, you can type in your question and send it to us. It will be our endeavor to ask as many questions as we can reasonably cover during the course of the webinar, which is a one hour duration. Before I start with the distinguished panelists, I like to get an audience perception on what they think, how COVID situation is going to impact the way 
court will hear matters and would its impact be lasting or just passing dear audience the question for you is this can we put the slide please Can we have the poll slide, please? So the lockdown has now been in place for almost 25 days, and it will continue till 3rd May 2020, with courts, including the Honorable Supreme Court and many high courts across the country, quickly adopting to virtual filings and hearings. Do you think that this move towards a virtual court system a, is likely to sustain itself post lifting of the lockdown and bringing in a new normal for litigation in India? or die in a natural death post the lifting of the lockdown and we will be back to old process or see an integrated approach in terms of physical filings and hearings being the norm with virtual hearings limited to a small subset of matters the trickle down effect can we have the results please So majority of the people think that it is going to be a mix of both going forward. Uh, almost same percentage of people, 10% and 11% uh, are taking the extreme position, 10% uh, saying <clears throat> that this is going to be the new normal and 11% saying that this, after this we will revert to old processes, but 79% see a mix of both going forward. So, uh, Mr. Justice and Law, what is your view? Do you think that this move towards virtual courts is only a response to an unprecedented pandemic and things will go back to normal once the crisis is over? Or this is going to be the new normal? Or as the audience poll suggests, it is going to be a mix of both. Good morning, Sanjeev, and good morning, Vinita. A special good morning to Mr. Vishwanathan. It's uh, so good to see all of you after nearly a month. And uh, thank you for having me on the panel. It's uh, what we in the court also have been debating. Uh, but uh, Sanjeev, a word of caution before I answer your question. This use of the word virtual court is uh, giving rise to some issues. I don't know whether you had a chance to read the solicitor's piece where he has said that a lawyer with his ingenuity, the solicitor general, Mr. Kushar Mehta, that uh, any lawyer with his ingenuity would say that uh, the verdict handed out to him is uh, null and void for quorum non judice. And even otherwise, virtual means uh, as close to the court, but uh, a court is not a place. Uh, CPC or I was trying to, I was sure about the CPC, I was trying to look up uh, as any other law which is defining the court, but I could not find any. So court is, uh, uh, we lay down, the laws lay down the territorial jurisdictions, but no venue of the court is marked by any of the laws. So the court is not the place. We are all used to a court being at a particular location or the courtrooms. But uh, virtually a court is wherever the justice delivery system is operating. So here the court becomes a virtual or a, becomes an e-court. So I think a nomenclature of uh, e-court would be better to avoid somebody from taking a plea that I've been beaten. I meted out a this decision not by the court, but by a forum as close to the court. Now, coming back to your question, uh, see, this is, uh, it's not as if uh, what we have today is uh, a, a response, a sudden response to the situation which we are in. This has been in the making, I can speak for the Delhi High Court, for the last uh, about 10 years. And it was existing, uh, because it was existing, is why we are able to put it to use. 
in this one month we could not have collated everything the infrastructure the technology to begin all this of course some other courts are using the e platforms which uh, have been made available by others but uh, delhi high court has been for some time now using the nic system of cisco which has worked well the only difference is that uh, we were not using it that extensively as we are using today we were using it for recording witness statements as you are aware in a large number of cases all witnesses outside delhi were being recorded especially in foreign jurisdictions were being recorded via video conferencing and that was through the court system only uh, i have consulted a expert in one of the hearings via video conferencing then in the red jurisdiction the courts are known to have the red court is known to that's why we have provided screens in each court room and the courts whenever even of uh, senior officials in delhi the presence has been shot on that screen rather than sending them to the court to not waste their time in coming and going to the court so it is uh, Uh, yes we have started using it to this extent because of this but it was in existence in a number of courts now going back to the normal uh, i think uh, i'll go with the majority view i was quite inclined to press the button myself when i saw your note that we cannot vote so but yes some changes will come i think the use would be to a larger extent that all of us are now used to it so i think a lot of uh, uh, in fact there is a very interesting statement by mr arvind dadar he said that all councils should start their briefings via video conferencing instead of the councils uh, the briefing council going to the senior councils chamber and that has a lot of advantage you know i the busy senior councils like mr vishwanathan i have never had a occasion to brief him but a number of other councils busy councils when i had to wait in their chambers for a very long time so all that would be obviated once we have fixed time so i think they'll be used to that extent then uh, there would be an advantage to the judge also there are a lot of times when the judge is held up in another city or at his home only and is unable to reach the court in those instances also it would not be necessary for the judge to take a leave for that day and uh, maybe in future we will use it for those things so some hearings also especially outstation councils today you know especially in delhi and in the high court and the supreme court a lot of lawyers travel from other cities so that can again be changed we can have we, we don't need to call the councils to the court and those outstation councils can be heard so that's how i think and slowly we will evolve that that is how i feel it will that the future is holding for us thank, thank you justice and law thank you so much and yes i think uh, 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 e courts might be a better terminology than virtual courts and uh, <laughs> you are right obviously i think uh, the 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 entire mechanism of the court is to dispense justice irrespective of the place and the manner in which it holds it yes. uh, uh, so so that uh, 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 brings me uh, 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 to a question uh, mr vishwanathan So, Mr. Vishwanathan, uh, access to justice uh, obviously means freedom to freely access courts in a, and it is a very uh, sacrosanct right which has been uh, recognized uh, by Indian law. Speedy justice, in fact, has been held to be a fundamental right. How do you think that this switch to technology and en enabled e-courts will impact this right? thank you sanjeev at the very outset uh, let me congratulate uh, kaitan and company for hosting uh, this uh, seminar or a webinar on a topic of uh, seminal significance 
let me also convey uh, my happiness and uh, an absolute privilege to share the uh, platform with Honorable Justice Endlaw. And um, my happiness to share the platform with Sanjeev and Vanita and to be in uh, front of a huge audience. The audience are spot on, having taken time out on a Saturday morning to join us when they rightly predict that it will be a mix of both going forward. But coming to your direct question, I think it is it, this video conference hearing, though under the compulsion of the lockdown, will give an impetus to access to justice and access to courts. Just imagine if this were become, to become the rule, and it is bound to become one day from an exception which it is now. People from the remote corners of this great country will be able to access the court. The reach of the court will improve. I am talking of the Supreme Court because the jurisdiction extends to the entire country. Imagine where an emergent order has to be obtained from far away Kanyakumari or Trivandrum. Once our systems are in place, all that the lawyer will have to do is to access the portal, file his pleading, and seek a hearing. And there will be a day when, considering the urgency, the judges will assemble from their respective houses, pass orders, which will have the same effect that it will have when they sit in court at 10.30 and pass. It is, as Justice Endor rightly said, the order of a court binding under 141, all authorities under Article 144 to aid its enforcement. I think it will be fantastic if what we are compelled to do under this scenario becomes the rule. And I foresee it becoming, in the next five to six years, Immediately going forward, yes, it will be a mix of both, but we will soon get adjusted to it. Access to justice, access to court has received the greatest impetus. It is a very positive development and I wholeheartedly welcome it. And I can only share that in the five appearances I've had till now, they've all been fabulous, extreme urgent matters, orders to be obtained because deadlines were expiring some uh, stay to be obtained because there was a reversal of transaction. What would not have been possible has become possible. And I'm sure in the way going forward, we will only improve upon it. And I think it's a positive sign. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vishwanathan. Uh, before I come to Venita, I just want to pick on one point uh, which uh, Justice and Law made. Uh, uh, and Justice Enlaw, uh, you rightly pointed out that uh, judiciary and especially the higher judiciary has been active in this pandemic. And uh, though the Supreme Court has already led the way for virtual hearing, uh, but uh, Delhi High Court was always ahead of the curve. And it had e-courts which were functional and electric, electronic findings were allowed. Having invested in such technology and infrastructure had actually helped Delhi High Court adapt quickly to crisis while we see many high courts are still lagging. With investments in technology showing results, do you think that this will be a learning and judiciary will need to invest more and reskill itself to new technological solutions like, uh, let's say, virtual hair, artificial intelligence, etc.? Yes, yeah, Sajeev, some uh, change is bound to be there. But uh, there is a lot of resistance, uh, and uh, I'll tell you the thought process uh, why the Delhi High Court started this 10 years back, and which has paid dividend now. That, uh, um, see, this all this is for the generation next. So, this preparation, once my generation of judges and lawyers phase out of the system, I think it's uh, an automatic change which will come in the society because today the students, uh, fresh lawyers who are coming, they are not used to paper. They can't, uh, I'll tell you from my own home, my son when he had joined the profession, 
he said he could think and uh, dictate at the same time. He could think and punch. So uh, that is the change. He does not have any library. He doesn't subscribe to any uh, journals like we used to do and maintain huge libraries. So that is bound to be, and I think it's a matter of maximum five years that uh, uh, this uh, will happen. About artificial intelligence, there are a lot of tools available, but uh, there is some uh, peculiarity of uh, the Indian decision making Indian courts, which uh, may not, plus uh, in India, the cost of litigation is much lower than the jurisdictions with respect to which we are speaking. So there, the artificial intelligence, for instance, about predicting the outcome of a case before a particular judge is taken to avoid going to the trial. That is uh, what I read is the most oft used tool by the litigants over there at the pre-trial stage. And besides the others which the lawyers and the law offices are using, of course, for preparation, of which there are innumerable. But as far as courts are concerned, yes. And uh, in India, the decision, uh, the cost is less plus our decision making has a lot of element, a very large element of discretion, which is again not there in the other jurisdictions. And that's a criticism of uh, our decision making that we exercise the discretion too much. And that's right. We do not have any precedent, nobody can predict the outcome. But uh, maybe in our circumstances, in our economic scenario, that is more suitable and that has served the country well till now because facts of no two cases are alive and cases are decided largely on facts. So that would be my response to this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Justice Law. And it's very right that what we are investing is for generation next. So, Vanita, coming to you, uh, and as a litigation lawyer, I have also uh, experienced this. Uh, while a hearing is going on in a court, the situation, uh, uh, let me say, is, is very alive. There are consultations, prompting, notes getting passed between client, briefing counsel, senior counsels. And in a complex case, we generally see that. At each site has easily four to five assisting lawyers who are all kind of uh, involved in the matter. Uh, so how do you, Vanita, manage all this in a virtual hearing when all are scattered across locations? Do you find that this is an impediment or you have found some new ways of coordination? Thank you, Sanjeev. And uh, very good morning to everyone. And uh, Privileged to share this virtual platform for Honorable Justice Enlo and Sir Vishwanathan Sir and my esteemed colleague. Uh, so Sanjeev, uh, I think the answer to what you have said uh, is uh, lies in investment in and adoption of high quality video conferencing technology and imparting training to stakeholders uh, with uh, respect to the same. So one way could be using two sets of equipments. So of course it involves a cost and uh, we'll have to see whether everybody can have access to that. But one could be using uh, two or multiple sets of equipments, one for interfacing with judges and one with the clients and senior counsel. Uh, the court may also, the courts may also accommodate requests to allow advocates to mute himself and consult with the clients or associates, et cetera, if required. So that uh, again is a change in the way we function or the change in the uh, court craft, court etiquettes. Then uh, chat boxes can be used by AORs to communicate with senior counsel who after making submission may request the court to go through the chat box and make additional submissions if necessary or rectify submissions uh, which may sometimes inadvertently, you know, they, they might be made. Uh, Currently, however, the new circular of the Supreme Court of 18th April, it uh, allows only two appearance li links for each party. But I'm sure once the lockdown is lifted, uh, these problems can be creased out and the AOR and client can meet at one place at the senior's office or some other location. Uh, but uh, going forward, I think uh, in the current uh, lockdown crisis, 
we might be facing a situation of communication but uh, going forward uh, and with the adoption of very uh, high speed technology even those problems can be creased out thank you Peter, thank you so much so so uh, good to hear that uh, people are adapting to new way of working uh, so mr vishwanathan also sir from an arguing council's perspective do you miss the ease with which instructions could have been given to you earlier in a physical courtroom? Does virtual hearings require a very different kind of a skill set? And would senior counsels also need to retool and reskill themselves to this new way of functioning? Uh, Sanjeev, uh, there are two ways of looking at this. One is we are in a lockdown and there is a video hearing happening councils may be scattered but once the lockdown is lifted and the video hearing happens maybe the councils will be uh, assembled in one conference room then the discussions would be easily possible even otherwise as vanita has very rightly suggested with advanced equipment and mute uh, facility one could easily uh, discuss coming to the skill sets i find that um, you need to be much more precise considering the time limit which is available and considering that you're before a uh, computer. So I think that helps you polish your thoughts, refine your ideas, maybe rehearse the first few words so that you are automatically driven to focus on the most essential aspect of the case. I think that skill is bound to improve of a counsel. I'm not saying that in court you don't need, need it, but you suddenly feel because of the vast space, physical space available, you have much more time and you can come back and you can you know, always uh, have time to adjust. But in a virtual hearing, this is one skill set. The second I found is when you are reading papers digitally, I don't know how others feel. Maybe the younger generation is already very focused. My focus was much better. When I had to access page number 400 on my desktop simultaneous with the Microsoft team or WebEx conference, which uh, we were having, the focus was better. I could highlight. So these are things which, you know, like a child has found a new toy in our case. And in the case of youngsters, it's already happening. They just click something and then, you know, everything is there. And uh, I think it's a skill set which different generations of lawyers will acquire. It is uh, something which will happen for the good. Uh, so my view is that um, it is a positive measure. It will automatically improve the precision and expression of counsel and the focus of the reading and the mind wanderings will be of a much lesser order. Thank you, Mr. Vishwanathan. Thank you. I think that reskill and retooling will happen, and also uh, with with uh, advancements, technologies will become much more uh, user friendly. It still is, but I think there is always a scope for in improvement. Uh, let me share an incident. Uh, Sanjeev, so may I just interrupt at this stage in the context? Please, sir. Please, sir. Go ahead. Yeah. In the context of what Mr. Vishwanathan said, I think this is a splendid opportunity besides about the e-courts for a course correction in the profession and in the bench. And uh, we, we have, I think we have to concentrate more on that course correction about the profession and uh, then on the e-court because e-court, in my opinion, will in any case happen and is happening so that course correction about the things what mr vishwanathan has said i think that is the most important thing because see it's uh, it doesn't seem nice every day reading four crore cases pending in the courts so that is the only way we can uh, achieve some speed there is no point in saying we should have more judges we should have more infrastructure we have to see what we can do in the given state of affairs and in this context 
One thing I have been urging on other platforms also is that uh, this is a splendid time to do away with this uh, manner of addressing the courts. Uh, you know what, what we have been talking of for years. Because when we are on a video uh, hearing, then uh, I think generally what comes out of say, from sitting in your chair, the word sir or any other nomenclature come. So this should be used to do away with those nomenclatures in the court as well. And we should all train ourselves for that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, 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 I, I think I think the technology will also uh, change the way in which uh, people address the court, uh, definitely and certainly. Mr. Vishwanathan already pointed out that one would need to be much more focused and much more precise, uh, and there is less error for uh, 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 rectification later on. So uh, it would, uh, in my view, also uh, change the way, uh, and and there's going to be a new etiquette of addressing the courts, uh, e-courts, uh, virtually. Uh, at this stage, let me share an incident with all of you. Uh, owing to this pandemic, the organizers of WIS Vienna Moot, which is one of the oldest and most pre prestigious moot court competitions in the world, decided to host the oral rounds virtually. And the final was conducted on 9th of April 2020. What I found astonishing is that the completion that the entire competition, despite being a virtual one this year, saw participation from 248 teams. In my view, to manage and pull off this event seamlessly, seamlessly with such massive part participation was simply outstanding. Justice and law, can these be examples which illustrate that technology and infrastructure is certainly there and available, but what is lacking is only a will to adapt. And what, in your view, can be done to make people to embrace and adapt to this new normal? See, Sanjeev, first of all, while this this uh, moot, I think uh, that new JS students who have uh, won this year, they have missed out on one very essential part of uh such a prestigious moot competition again speaking from home experience it's not only about preparation or delivery it involves a whole lot of other things which i regret that uh, these students have lost uh, see uh, uh, they start collecting funds for going to the moot now that is a very a learning experience for the students most of the people who are participating would not have done a foreign travel abroad or a foreign travel abroad alone. So that itself is an experience. Then going and living in a campus or a university which is hosting the moot, that is a great experience. They interact with the students over there. And then the sheer thrill of performing life and coming back with the trophy that I think uh, these kids have missed out on. Now, I think the impediment uh, to moving all litigation to virtual courts is uh, not a mindset only. There is There are other aspects. See, the hearing in a courtroom and going to the courtroom for a hearing, that has a certain other. See, we are not machines. There is a romance about litigation in a court about going there and it's again not only addressing when you go to the court you see the performance of other lawyers you measure your performance vis-a-vis -vis them you are mentally making a note okay what not to do you are reading the judge you are learning new points while sitting in the court things because it's such a vast subject that all of us would not nobody can claim to know everything so it's a great knowledge and answer. And then at the end of it, see, you gossip, you meet your colleagues, you have a cup of coffee. Now, all that makes us more alive. Otherwise, we would be mere machines if we were to be confined to our uh, chambers and working. I am speaking for myself. 
If I don't have a cup of coffee at 5, 5, 30 with a few of my colleagues, I can't work till 8, 39. So that is a very essential. You have to vent out because, see, that was a big shift from the bar to the bench. That in the chamber, one always had about 8, 10 people around you. Now you are made to go and sit alone in the chamber throughout the day, throughout the evening. So it becomes impossible to work. So please don't forget that uh, we are talking of human beings. We are not talking of artificial intelligence delivering. And, uh, see, I speaking for myself, I am not doing uh, the kind of litigation the law firms do. Uh, mine was a more of a what was a higher arm, higher arm litigation, which is called. And I received a number of clients who just saw me in the court and approached me. They wanted to change their noise. So that's a big uh, push. That was a big high in my career to be able to get a client like that. So uh, there are a lot of other things about the porch and all that will keep the porch alive. I don't think the court room is going to die now. Thank you. You, you are so right, this is in law. I think uh, a physical court hearing is uh, so much more holistic. And obviously, uh, what you might think is wasting your time or whiling your time, in fact, is something which is uh, creating a character or improving your personality. Uh, you are meeting so many people and learning from them. You are watching other councils argue. Uh, 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 so, so all that, all that would be missed in a world in case we completely change to e-filings and e-codes. Uh, so, so uh, Mr. Vishnathan, you raised a point, and I'm going to pick on that point. Uh, you said that a virtual hearing is a new game altogether, and uh, you have to be very brief and precise in your oral submissions uh, and very focused. But oral submissions would only be a small part of a e-code or an e-hearing. A typical e-hearing will require many other things, like real-time accessibility of records in a digital form, which is accessible to all stakeholders, virtual client meetings, testimony of witnesses and experts, transcription of hearings, etc. So how do you see these things going forward, lifting of post down? Would judiciary need to come out with some kind of a centralized protocol and a playbook for how various aspects of a e-hearing will be dealt with so that there is complete clarity among its users? Uh, yes, Sanjeev, uh, that's an important uh, question. The no two views that uh, post lockdown, the judiciary will have to ramp up its infrastructure in a very big way. The bandwidth will have to be improved. The best of the platforms will have to be selected. Uh, I understand there are large grants given to the ET sec segment of the court. We don't know about uh, uh, exactly in terms of uh, the figures. Coming down to the uh, aspect of the lawyers and the nature of work that can easily be adapted to this, let me uh, straight away point out, uh, in accordance with the uh, majority voters in the poll, which incidentally is also echoed by Professor Richard Suskin one of the leading uh, authorities on uh, IT in the world. He is the uh, IT advisor to the Chief Justice of England and Wales, and he has been regularly publishing. I have with me the 2012 edition of his book. Many of you would have seen it. There are subsequent editions. He concedes that large, complex cases, cases involving multiple parties and big trials, for a start, we'll have to be held under brick and mortar. It, it will be difficult to straight away adapt them uh, here. But that said, that should not deter us, that should make us diffident. Whatever is possible, we must get along. With regard to the other trials, other appeals, video conferencing has many facets. A video conference hearing would also mean that papers will be digital. So that will mean that uh, a large segment of lawyers need to get used to this concept of digitalization of the records. 
one suggestion is that uh, workshops need to be held exclusively for this how to handle records digitally and how to you know familiarize yourself with what justice enlo mentioned at the outset of having conferences on platforms without having to travel and wait at council's uh, office these are the ancillary aspects of a video conference hearings which are very very important so finance is important ramping up of infrastructure is going to be important adaptability is important keeping aside matters which would not come within the compass is important and more importantly coming directly to what you raised just as the delhi high court has its guidelines on video conferencing which finds recognition in justice chandrachud's judgment though the minority judgment in santini's case which is also broadly in pari materia with the seol convention on video conferencing for uh, arbitrations certain basic protocols are laid down about uh, the witness and the judge end of the proceedings about written submissions about the technological team about the backup measures to be kept up there are a whole host of protocols uh, you may see the very high court guidelines or the seol conferencing now this may have to be centralized there may, may have to be a scheme or a guideline which needs to be enacted to put in place a common protocol on which there could be you know b b b b adaptations so i think these are all important measures but uh, these are all easily achievable and uh, uh, saskin's uh, lectures books give you ample material to uh, go, go ahead with this and uh, i think it's exciting times ahead and these are all uh, certain uh, inevitable aspects which will have to be uh, enacted adapted etc thank you mr vishwanathan thank you so much and and uh, the saskins book has got a very very scary title for our profession which is called the end of a lawyer but if you go through the book i think it's it's a uh, treasure trove of knowledge on how technology is going to change the way uh, we are functioning and mind you uh, this is not a reaction to this pandemic this book uh, has come some 7 8 years back so vinita coming to you uh, i think you are the uh, only interface or link which is between the client and the court which is a justice delivery system and what steps do you think a client or a litigant needs to take or you need to edu educate him so that he can take advantage of virtual court hearing systems or e court hearing systems so uh, so litigant in order to adapt uh, to a virtual court hearing system uh, i think essentially needs the following uh, firstly digitization of record uh, pertaining to all transactions and dealings be maintained Uh, so that if and when any dispute arises and one has to approach courts uh, time is saved in scanning documents so now most of the corporates already follow the system but uh, going forward this should be adopted as a uniform policy uh, because and for some individuals this may not be possible uh, so steps may be taken uh, like sir uh, just uh, mr vishwanathan said that uh, maybe workshop should be held to uh, educate people on digitization of record and the importance of the same then another important aspect that the clients will have to invest in and uh, they have to invest in it infrastructure and a dedicated it department that can quickly fix technical uh, technological glitches uh, and that has become the need of the hour so they'll have to maybe uh, keep aside a certain amount for investment in it uh then investment in security software uh, that prevents hacking and leak of confidential documents that is also very essential so there are many tools available and i'm sure that once uh, the, the, the e court system and every, uh, they it catch on uh, then there'll be more uh, research into this field and uh, i'm sure the technology will continue to keep developing and uh, the clients need to keep pace with uh, that uh, then it is also important to have digital signatures in place uh, investment in high speed internet is become uh, so as to become part of virtual conferences with seniors and a virtual court hearing is also essential 
Uh, to that extent, I think the government also needs to invest in the infrastructure for the same and uh, to bring that accessibility to over a larger area, not just confined to a few areas. Uh, and then in case of uh, a client is a company, I think it would be helpful to for the client to have the board resolution, authorization letters in place, uh, and Vakalatnama, uh, etc., uh, signed and stamped. So those are just housekeeping and other procedural issues, which of course, like you said, we'll have to educate the clients. Uh, first, we'll have to make them aware of uh, the different procedures and the system uh, in order to make them more receptive to the new way of working. Because sometimes uh, the clients have a, a, a mental block that they might not get a fair hearing or it might not be as effective as it was before a physical court. And like we discussed earlier, because of the fact that he might think that he might not be able to communicate uh, with the senior or with, the, you know, more efficiently with the court. So I think we need to make them aware, uh, which uh, to make them know about the advantages and disadvantages. So, for example, we have tried to make the clients aware of the new directions of the, the Supreme Court and High Court uh, regarding urgent for mentioning conduct of hearings filing procedure. So as to bridge the gap between client expectation in terms of timelines and results. For example, earlier a client would immediately know the outcome of urgent mentioning. Uh, however, now one has to wait for the mail from the competent authority as to whether the urgent request has been accepted or denied. Uh, now with virtual courts, clients can be fully aware of all the arguments, but the advantage, one of the advantages is that with virtual courts, courts clients can be fully aware of all the arguments made. Since due to overcrowding in courts, many clients, especially on miscellaneous days, were usually lost as to what was stated in court. So I think if a virtual court policy is put in place in future, uh, uh, you know, because of the accessibility, the government in participation with the private sector or otherwise will have to provide facilitation centers in various places so that individuals and economically challenged litigants can also aware of the interest, uh, avail of the infrastructure. Because for corporates, all these things might already be in place. But I think the need of the R is to uh, put up more facilitation centers for other litigants as well. Thank you. Thank you, Vinita. Thank you so much. I think this was really helpful as to how going forward, we need to involve clients also in the process. So, so, so just as I don't know, there was a survey which was conducted by Queen Mary University in association with White and Case. Uh, on international arbitrations in 2018 and it might have some bearing on the way litigation is conducted and also a bearing on the way litigation is conducting in indian courts also and one of the findings of the survey was that users believed that the main reason for lesser use of it and artificial intelligence was lack of familiarity and concern of cost users also expressed fear regarding allowing technologies to interfere excessively with the adjudication function which was supposed to be inherently human. Do you think these are concerns which are genuine and would be true in an Indian litigation context also? And if yes, is there a way in which uh, we can mitigate these concerns? See, uh, what uh, Vinita pointed out, uh, I'll tell you one facet of it which we are having tremendous problem about electronic evidence. Now, today on the criminal jurisdiction, most of the evidence which is coming before the courts are cell phones in which a recording has been made or a photograph has been taken. Now, following the old system, those cell phones are deposited in the court. And uh, by the time it comes for trial, it is found that they have discharged, even if with somehow it has managed to charge them up. The system is corrupted because it has been in disuse. So the Supreme Court had constituted a volunteer committee to go into this aspect of electronic evidence. So all uh, India consultations were held, and uh, I, I happen to be a member of that committee. And uh, Ultimately, in consultation with CDAC and a host of other authorities, it was recommended, which is still before the Supreme Court, that uh, some kind of e-kiosks have to be set up 
in each district and which would make a image immediately when the thing is deposited and all the ports should have a system where the image of that software can be transmitted and protocols were laid down that how the security of that image will be preserved now that involves uh, then we had an occasion to meet the law minister also in that connection and it entails the involvement of the state governments as well as that so that proposal has still been pending for the last over one year nothing further has happened so that is uh, one step which as venita said that not only that was concerning electronic evidence but about a host of other things because let's uh, profile the litigation in india the litigation is not only amongst corporates the bulk of the litigation is amongst the individuals so unless we have a provision today also for instance i did not want to call the stenographer for the orders so i wanted him to take it at his residence now all the stenographers don't have a computer or a laptop at their residence i'm talking about the court stenographers so once we solved that problem then the problem came of wifi that uh, they did not have that connection so when sitting in delhi and in the delhi high court in spite of being prepared for so long we found these difficulties i can imagine the difficulties will be much uh, more elsewhere and uh, you are uh, the second aspect i think the faith is definitely there and the court room hearing has an advantage there is a formality about it and i think which is very essential see a judge when i was appointed as a judge i was told that you are not the judge that means the 40 people sitting in front of you throughout the day they are judging you so you are being judged and the same about the lawyer what i mentioned see a lawyer standing in the court is aware there are 40 other people watching him in a e hearing see we are i don't think anybody will switch on we we'll have to give time so once uh, a person knows that his matter is not likely to come before the 12:30 slot he is not likely to uh, open up his system and watch the other matter they will do something else so that uh, formal atmosphere till now is a part of the litigation system and unless we get over that also there would always be a problem in implementation in fact about a uh, witness examination i have had an objection because as you are aware cross examination was my bread and butter as a lawyer and cross examination is a mind game so you are playing a mind game with the witness the witness sitting in the security of a notary public in his jurisdiction or sitting in his lawyer's office or sitting in the high commission or the embassy he is not susceptible to those kind of pressures to speak the truth which a witness uh, uh, in the courtroom is under in fact i have noticed the difference uh, that if you give the witness in the witness box a chair to sit down and he becomes relaxed the cross examination is different as answers are different so it's a uh, so that's why according to me e hearings are well suited for final hearings in the suit or in the prosecutions but not for trial plus they are of course suitable for writ jurisdiction for appellate jurisdiction but trial has to be in the courtroom thank you thank you thank you and i think uh, very aptly put and this is uh, a concern because many people have objected to virtual hearing saying that loss of in person observation of witness testimony will impair their abil ability to form an opinion on the credibility and strength of the witness uh, so uh, so mr bishwanath in addition to the problems which uh, uh, justice and law has provided uh, first is of making up of infrastructure as simple as having a uh, wifi connection and a laptop with the person who is assisting him uh, 
uh, uh, to other issues which have been pointed out. Uh, do you think uh, the time is apt for us to change? Because a complex litigation sometimes will have hundreds, if not thousands of pages and may also involve large number of parties. Then uh, in Supreme Court uh, and even in high courts, we have a concept of batch matter hearings, wherein all matters which are involving a similar issue are tagged and heard together with each concerned party being given a chance of hearing. And sometimes tagged match, batch matter can be 100. Do you think in matters like these, it would be possible to have uh, uh, video conference uh, hearings? Sajiv, before I come to that, uh, may I only uh, endorse what uh, the important point that uh, Vanita raised on uh, one on uh, uh, security and the other on the delayed response to a mentioning request. Security is very important. There has to be a proper firewall because the documents are very confidential. On the mentioning, it's causing a lot of hardship. The point is extremely well taken and I was having a suggestion that whether there could not be an exclusive mentioning video conference hearing where you only tell the judge in two minutes what your case is and then the judge says yes list it or no so that there is no uncertainty. I think uh, Vanita uh, maybe you could uh, take it up at the association level and uh, take it forward uh, if you find merit in it. And on uh, this is end of suggestion of uh, Wi-Fi at the residence my research team which helped me with this seminar my associates uh, they tell me that uh, there is only 36 percent of the population which has internet connection in india so that has to be addressed so 64 i'm i don't know how accurate this is but uh, this has been given to me 64 percent have no internet connection now coming to your question on the complex uh, cases complex trials even Richard Suskin concedes that uh, it is not possible. In fact, if I can read out to you what he says on this. Uh, no, then I'll get the page right immediately. He clearly says on the chapter 10 dealing with uh, judges, IT, virtual courts and online dispute that complex trials, complex cases, even appeals involving, uh, as you said, large number of parties will have to be confined to uh, hearings in court, in court, so that, you know, uh, there is no prejudice, even if the platforms are extremely well developed, it can virtually, you know, replicate a uh, court. Uh, unless we attain that stage, which will take a while. But the point is, exception should not, you know, decide the way we go forward. So while we continue to work on that, the advantage that we gain by this should not be lost. And the metamorphosis um, of making what is now an exception a uh, rule should grow very fast is the point, Sanjeev. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, I think exception should not be the ones which are making the rules. Vinita, I think uh, by, by the problems which you are facing on mentioning, we have got a question from the audience, uh, which uh, uh, is very related. And I, uh, I, I'm just putting that to you. So audience wants to know, what do you think is more difficult presently? Uh, do you find physical filing uh, difficult or you, fi uh, you find filing electronically difficult? And how do you think the, the systems can improve more? Uh, so um, in the earlier circulars, uh, sure on uh, 23rd March and 26th March, uh, prayers for urgent listing had to be uh, sent through mail. And if matter did not appear in the list the uh, next day, one could phone the uh, landline phone of the honorable presiding judge. But uh, with the 15th April circular, the urgency will now be decided by the competent authority. And if the request is declined, the option of uh, phoning the honorable presiding judge is done away with. So uh, firstly, determining the urgency based on a one page note without a chance to orally mention, like uh, Mr. Vishwanathan said that if maybe we can put it to the bar and at least allow us to mention, uh, maybe in brief and maybe with a one page note. 
so it may lead to dissatisfaction in the sense of not being given a fair hearing so uh, further sometimes there may be like communication lag that uh, we mentioned earlier then as far as e filing is concerned we we face a lot of uh, technical glitches uh, either due to problem with equipment or internet connectivity so for example uh, practically like we recently wanted to file an urgent matter but the same could not be uploaded for the entire day and it was only at around in the night at around 9 pm that it got uploaded and then we called the registrar we were told that many people were attempting to file their cases at the same time so one had to keep trying after several intervals now to keep a dedicated person on a computer just keep to keep trying so that is a, one of the practical difficulties uh, so and further now in the current situation without i mean it has suddenly come about so i don't think many people are trained so many people are not comfortable with the software although supreme court has issued guidelines for usage and has also created a helpline uh, but uh, again once the lockdown lifts and uh, imparting training would be very useful to be prepared in the future uh, then uh, there are times uh, when a party seeks to uh, rely on documents uh, which have come to their knowledge subsequently or just before the hearing and which the same could not have been filed maybe due to some urgency or some other reason now in the circular of 15th april 2020 uh, it is provided that advocate is not allowed to rely on documents not filed so a system may be created at a party may either be allowed to email the same at the time of hearing or a subsequent stage because just for this uh, uh, maybe uh, 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 this the, the adjudication might suffer that you are not able to rely on uh, something that just come which is relevant and has come to your knowledge later then another difficulty in e filing is uh, because like i said some of the our uh, uh, clients were following digitization of records so they could easily send us scanned documents and we could collate and file but practically scanning bulky documents especially in the situation of lockdown is a time consuming process and if there are more than one matters to be filed if suppose it becomes the norm in the future then that will affect timeline and efficiency but again like as it will be uh, it can get creased out when people adapt and they uh, start maintaining digitization and then it can very smoothly be handed over to the advocate and then filed uh, so and now even though e filing is there some pages still print out has to be taken and signed and then scanned and uploaded so uh, that again I, like i said it's uh, for the current situation that can be a difficulty because sometimes you don't have access at some homes we don't have access to printer or even ink and uh, then like uh, uh, sir was saying uh, on confidence confidentiality so documents may be tampered with while being shared virtually so uh, i i uh, so i think uh, the uh, this uh, anxiety should be assuaged as to what software what security software is being used uh, and uh, i guess everybody will need to uh, be educated i mean even the client side as well as the supreme court or, or the, any e court will have to take steps to uh, ensure uh, that uh, there is no hacking or uh, 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 or the same uh, then currently there is an exemption from having a document notarized uh, notarization is an important aspect of ensuring authenticity in statements and also ensuring that a person signing the affidavit understands what he is putting his affirmation to uh, so although once a lockdown ends this process would still need to be continued physically uh, so therefore with the e filing this managing client expectation in light of above is tricky uh, but of course we are making the clients aware so i feel e filing in current work from home situation where one can face logistical issues like uh, access to scanner printer etc is time consuming and difficult uh, currently but however there is no other choice but going forward when situation eases e filing would be easier and once everything falls into place that even the clients know what they're supposed to do that if every you know everything should be in place and the technological uh, technological glitches are put in place so e filing going forward uh, i think would be easier thank you vanita it appears that you are really missing the physical filings as of now but you are really very hopeful that in future the things are uh, going to improve uh, so I, uh, I'm aware of the fact that uh, we are uh, at 12:36, 
and i'll just take one question which is uh, 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 for for mr anlaw uh, uh, from the audience so so essentially it says that uh, technology is something which comes at a cost and the cost may definitely go down with advancements of technology but but still some basic investments in technology hardware software etc would be required as you pointed out uh, like a virtual hearing uh, or e hearing you would need a computer with a webcam a software uh, software and internet connection so how can we ensure that the underprivileged are not denied of these technological benefits and such solutions are available to all including them um so the only way is for the state to make the infrastructure available and uh, for the state to as i mentioned earlier those e kiosks which were proposed they should also be available for hearing for anybody who wants to avail of a, a, a e court hearing so that is the only way there is no other way in fact uh, since vinita mentioned it Uh, in the high court we have also some of us have been discussing that uh, in fact mr vishnathan i would like to put this to you that uh, uh, if somebody disclaims a adverse order against him that i never filed it because the lawyers who are filing are not digitally signing signing it so after suffering an adverse order the filing itself can be disclaimed in a second round availed of that is a genuine that that is a problem which may arise by a unscrupulous litigant you have any thoughts on it i thought i'll discuss with you since we have the benefit of your presence sir that's a problem and you can't rule out uh, black sheep uh, in the profession also but uh, suppose uh, 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 email from the lawyer which is a registered email with the court is also to follow up uh, the document i mean even if he is a counsel um, and if since that can be traced back uh, by the server uh, as to where from where exactly it has uh, begun the only defense he can have is that his email was uh, hacked but that, that that will be making it even more extreme so some such checks will have to be necessarily uh, uh, followed and uh, um, uh, to to ensure that and maybe once we are through with the lockdown an email filing with a certain time limit for urgent uh, affidavits can be insisted with the follow up of a duly sworn uh, affidavit lodged in court uh, an affidavit endorsing the um, filing uh, at least to that extent a one page or a two page affidavit with the email etc so that can be insisted to uh, get over uh, a possible abuse sir, but i don't uh, rule out i don't rule out that uh, these are the uh, problems which have to be addressed uh. likely so these are the problems which are to be addressed and obviously time will teach us how we are going to address them and and how we address them will then be a test as to whether the system is effective and efficient or the system is to be abandoned but i think uh, all hopes are and as the poll predicted and as we heard of a panelist uh, all hopes are that we would have a integrated kind of an approach where in in addition to physical hearings we will have e hearings also to increase the access to justice of the public i am afraid we are out of time now i hope you found this webinar interesting and worthwhile investment of your time we certainly enjoyed bringing it to you i will now like to end this seminar and i thank my fellow panelists for taking time to share their thoughts with us it was interesting to hear their views today on a very relevant issue thank you one again once again justice and law mr vishwanathan and vanita thank you our esteemed audience for your attendance today and we look forward to your presence at future webinars thank you and take care